it's kind of hard to learn when you're talking, right? So when you're listening, and if you're fortunate enough to get feedback from various people, isn't that really like a positive? The thing I think is that a lot of people equate feedback with criticism. And I think that's a culture thing. That's not necessarily true. I could give you positive feedback for the rest of your life and you never take it as criticism and you look forward to it. Welcome to Deep Dives. My name is Rid, and this is where we go deep with the best designers so that you can learn from their journey and apply it to your own career. Today's guest is Fonz Morris, who leads product design for global conversion and monetization at Netflix. This episode is a masterclass in growth design. We talk all about what it's like to wear the business hat as a designer and how your role changes when you're shipping your designs to millions of users all across the world. So without further ado, here's Fon sharing a little bit more about what makes his role unique at Netflix. My role at Netflix varies because I'm what you would consider a flex designer. So I'm fortunate enough to not be only on one specific project. I was one of the leads on the multi-household usage initiative that was about a two plus year project. But even before that, I was bouncing around from project to project. There's a lot of things that we're working on at the company, of course. Our main goal is to keep our customers happy, which is customer joy, and then also to increase our subscribers. But if people don't like the platform or don't like the service, they're not going to stay or they're going to downgrade their plan or they're going to just not sign up. So my day is constantly trying to get into the minds of these users and either make them happier or figure out how to make their onboarding to the company easier, whether that's through conversion from our sign-up flow at the beginning or how do we bring in more revenue, which would be an example of the multi-household usage situation. So my day is spent depending on what project I'm on, meetings, reading, creating documents, talking to teams, Slack. Sometimes I'm in Figma. I'm not in Figma as much as you would think I would be. There's a lot of product management as well on this side. We do have PMs, but I can honestly say that that as a growth designer, one of the skills and responsibilities that I've had to become better in and pick up is product management. So the day is long, but it's fun. And I get to interact with a lot of cool people. I learn something new about the platform every day. Can you talk a little bit more about learning the skill of product management? You, You have all these really ambiguous problems that you're working on that are a multi-year project, which is so vast to me. What is it like even knowing what you should be working on at any given moment? It takes a lot. I think that's one of the hardest parts about working at Netflix. It's very autonomous and your job description becomes very ambiguous at times. That's why they really do need senior level people in this position because you're going to be deciding what you should be working on as well as what this outcome should be. There's a lot of reliance on you as the individual but there's a lot of focus and there's a lot of communication. We also have a process of everything we're doing leads back into this bigger list of strategy bets that we have as a company. We do have a North Star and I'll say that's it. How you're going to get to that North Star is up to you. You're going to swim, you're going to fly, you're going to walk, you're going to take a bike. (laughs) However you're going to get there, that's up to you. But by having that North Star, now it's up to you to also understand all of your key partners and stakeholders and how to communicate with them and what different things you know you need to execute on this idea. And that doesn't necessarily mean productizing something, which means rolling out to all 200 million. It could mean just getting an idea validated or not, getting this A-B test up and running. What does it take to do that? You're going to need to work with your data science partners. You're going to need to work with your engineering team. You're going to need to work with your product manager. So you start to realize that It takes more than you to get things done. The other major part I think of my job and growth design that a lot of people don't talk about is I'm very interested in the business side. I'm not just Mm -hmm. only interested in the UX. I'm way more interested nowadays. Are we even working on the right problem more than I am? What's the execution of it going to look like? And to know if you're working on the right problem, that requires you to be in tune with your customers and in tune with the business. And that's why I spend a lot of my time doing consumer insights, which is UX research, as well as understanding where the business is going, where we may want to make some tweaks. Are there some low hanging fruit projects that we can do that could potentially impact revenue? There's just a lot of different things that you start understanding is really important for the business. And now you prioritize those and you chisel at them to get the job done. 
How do you approach user research when the user base is the size of Netflix and you're shipping to many, many millions of users? The thing about Netflix that I want everybody to understand is Netflix is a very, very inclusive and cross collaborative company. So because of that, we get really close access to our team mates and they're really there to support us. So when you think about how do we get UX research done at Netflix, my UX partners feel like they sit right next to me pretty much in a virtual space where I'm talking with them every day, all day. They're in all of our meetings from the beginning where we're doing UX research at the beginning of the project. As soon as we say we think we have an idea, got to got to take the research because how do you know you have a good idea? Are you just going to decide that? So we tend to lean on research a lot. As much as we can do, we will do on any project across the whole company. So it's not just growth that does UX research. It's the whole design team at Netflix tries to do as much UX research as possible. We have these super professional researchers on our team that now have the connections to set up as many qualitative or quantitative researches that we need to learn about whatever specific topic, and that's all across the globe. So if we want to do a global project, we'll do research all across the globe, meaning we'll do something maybe in Australia, something in EMEA, something in South America, something in UK, and something in Europe. So we're at least hearing from the users in those areas to have a clear understanding of what's going on, which I think always goes under user empathy. We work really closely with our researchers and we help plan out the dates. It's very team focused. So I'm involved with them. They're involved in the designs. I'm constantly sharing our designs with them, getting their feedback. So it's a true collaboration. That's how I think we really get things done is because it's such a close collaboration. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a well-oiled machine just listening to you describe it. I mean, we make it one. There's a lot of room for it to become unoiled, you know what I mean, or unhinged. So that's the other layer that I'm saying of the product management side. Nobody's going to tell you that you need to do research. You should know you probably want to do research. And now you need to figure out with your research partners, what are the right things to take the calls? How are you going to get this stuff done? How are you going to get it localized? Does it need to be localized? What markets are you going to put it in? So there's a lot of responsibility on us as employees at Netflix, but I think we get the resources to get stuff done. Can you talk a little bit about your part of the org as a growth designer and kind of how that fits into the bigger picture at Netflix? Sure. So we're still all under product, meaning we report up to the chief product officer, but there's a design side, there's the engineering side, there's the data science side. In those, now you get into the deeper of front end, back end engineering. The data side is our data science engineers. And then you have the design side and the design team is now split into different parts. Like there's the studio side of Netflix, which is the people that actually help us build the tools that we use. And then there's the other side, which is growth. And now the growth team is split into smaller sub teams that are all focused on certain parts of the growth experience. I'm currently right now working on the monetization side, but there's also a payment side. There's also the ad side. So just look at it as almost if the growth team at Netflix was just a pie, and then you sliced it up into different teams. Sub teams are focused on different parts that Netflix is trying to grow in. Okay. Thanks for explaining that. It makes a lot more sense. I'm hoping maybe we can step back a little bit from Netflix. You previously joined Coursera as lead growth designer back in 2018. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about your journey leading up to that point? And how did you get to the place where you decided that you wanted to be in growth design? So how did I decide I wanted to be in growth design? My journey to Coursera was very interesting. I was doing entrepreneurship right before that. I am a cold blooded entrepreneur. I love it. Shout out to all my entrepreneurs on the podcast right now. What ended up happening was life, honestly, Red. I was doing a startup with two college buddies of mine. We lost our biggest customer, which then led to us not really being able to have the money to keep the business afloat anymore. At this time, I was now married. I had a daughter. I couldn't take another risk on entrepreneurship. I needed stability. I needed some steady cash coming in. Because of my entrepreneurship though, if you think about it as an entrepreneur, you're always trying to grow your business. So I was doing growth design, but just wasn't calling it. It was just yep. 
called survival, I guess, or growing a business or designing is what most people called it, just designing. But what I really was doing was growth design. I had already founded three businesses as well as I had worked at Comcast on their growth team focused on converting people to sign up for Comcast as well as I worked at some agencies that were focused on creating ads, which was all about conversion. So when I look back at my career, most of my career has been in converting users, in acquisition, in retention. And that's the business side of design. I'm figuring out that stuff, but I'm also figuring out now the design side of how to execute on this. Because I did all of that, it had already set me up for a growth design position. I love online education, and I think education in general can change people's lives. It changed my life. It made sense for me to want to go into an industry that I was passionate about, and that's why I selected EdTech. And then I found out about Coursera through just creating my portfolio. I want to learn some skills. So Coursera I was like, man, they have some really good information on here. Maybe I could even see if they're hiring. And I ended up just applying online. I just sent my email information over and got a hit back. It just was so exciting because I was in such a tricky spot because the business had technically failed. And now I have to pick myself up. So to be able to get this opportunity to relocate my family from the East Coast in Philly out to Silicon Valley to live my dream of living in Cali and then working at a tech company was like a dream come true. Your story really resonates with me because I also was a founder turned designer. Like I learned design because I was trying to build a business. And after years of doing it, ultimately it went to zero. Like unfortunately a lot of companies do. And, and that was my first W2 role as a designer was exact same situation out of necessity. I'm married. I can't afford to take another big risk and another big swing. Now what? And I was like, well, I liked the design part the most. I'm going to dive in. And I'm really, really grateful for kind of even the order that I went through things. And I'm wondering if you could even expand on that a little bit more. Like how has starting off with entrepreneurship shaped you as a designer? Entrepreneurship has shaped me as a designer as it's made me scrappy, but it's also allowed me to have to care about a lot of different things that if you were an entrepreneur, you might not have had to worry about if you went straight into a salary position where I'm always worried about the numbers. I'm always worried about money coming in. I'm always worried about money going out. I'm always worried about how happy is the team? Are we working on the right or wrong things as opposed to just focused on execution. You learn that as an entrepreneur because your resources are low. It's almost as if you learn how to be lean. You can't ever really go wrong with learning how to be lean. So when you move up the ladder or you move to a larger company, you can still bring a lot of value by maintaining to stay lean and to stay scrappy, as well as thinking about multiple issues or problems or perspectives of things. You have to worry about that as an entrepreneur because you don't have anybody else to do it. So you learning all of those skills end up becoming very valuable when you go to a bigger company because they do need you to be multifaceted. You've brought up this idea of making sure you're working on the right thing a couple times now. Mm -hmm. It's always a tricky one for me. How do you know that you're heading in the right direction? What are the different tactics that you use? Well, one, you got to understand the longer roadmap because everything should be leading into that longer roadmap, right? And then you should have like a shorter roadmap that's very directed, like it really has a lot of effect on what you may be doing, right? So that roadmap is thought out and it's tied into metrics. It's like tied into goals. So it's almost like this is what you guys should be pointing towards. And now what are the steps that it takes to hit that goal. You should only be doing things that are going to help you get to that goal. Anything outside of that is the wrong thing to work on unless you're just trying to be innovative at the moment. And innovation is fine, but you can still be innovative while working on what you're supposed to do, what you should be working on. You create this path. And just stay on the trail. Like, don't weave off. Don't become reactive because it's very easy to become reactive once you get metrics back in. And it's like, whoa, this is not going as well as we thought. Let's go ahead and switch it. But are you jipping that idea by not giving it its time to breathe and really run as opposed to now going off the path and coming up with a quick new idea? You should stay focused. And I think that's how you decide what you should work on. You have this roadmap and you stick to it. A lot of teams don't have roadmaps. I got to be honest with you. I've been working closely with my design ops partners at Netflix now, and they've just really helped me understand how important having things like a roadmap is and making sure that all of the teams are aligned with that roadmap and you're using the right tools like 
Airtable so that everybody is on the same page. You're not only communicating in Slack, you're having the conversations open in an environment where everybody can see them. All of these things is what it takes to make sure that you're working on the right thing. So it's not just, oh, you pick something off the list. It's that there's this whole team unison agreement alignment that this thing we're working on will get us to this next step. Once you get that alignment and you actually start the project, how do you identify the right leading indicators that make sure you're actually moving the primary needles that you want to move? We just have a lot of really smart team mates that work on specific parts. So for right now, I'm working on how do we make sure our plans stay extremely valuable to our customers. I have two amazing teammates. One is a data science that helps us run and really understand all the metrics that the company would want to see to be able to really decide if this moved the needle or not. And we also have somebody from the team to help us really understand the revenue impact that this could have. So we have the specialists in place where I don't have to figure that out. I just need to figure out the question and now go get the answer. But the amazing part is I can always get the answer. The hard part is making sure I'm asking all of the right questions. But if I ask the right questions, I can get those answers. So we have the people in place to actually do the deep dive and tell us, well, these are the metrics that the company is looking for. And now from the design side, I need to make sure that the experience that I'm building or the test that I want to run is set up to improve those metrics. It's like they kind of give you the blueprint. They give you just a little bit of the blueprint, but you really have to figure it out on your own. Yeah. I mean, that makes, it makes sense. One of the things that I heard you mention is Airtable. I'm very interested in what tools you use as a growth designer, because my assumption is that you are living in the numbers a little bit mm -hmm. more than an average, you know, everyday product designer. So can you talk a little right. bit more about your analytical skill set and the different tools that you use to accomplish those goals? We have a lot of internal tools that, and remember, like I said before, we have a studio team. So we do have like this software engineering side of Netflix that I think is pretty obvious because we're a tech company, but we also have this like software application development side where we build a ton of tools for ourselves, for our contractors to use because certain things are just too hard to try to customize on our own. And then our engineers also build a lot of amazing dashboards for us. They work closely with our data scientists to build these different dashboards that show all of the different data and information that we need. So a lot of the tools that I'm using are just internal things that if I explained it to you, you wouldn't even really know what I'm what I'm talking about. But we do use Airtable for stuff like management wise to make sure there's a central place for people to be able to get the information that they need. Everybody stay on track. And then, of course, the obvious like Jira when we're doing design QA and then the super obvious ones like Google Docs, we create tons of docs. And this is how I can tell you I've grown as a designer. When I first started, I didn't like writing docs. They kind of made me uncomfortable because I didn't feel what I was creating was ever a good enough doc. So if I've ever had imposter syndrome, it wasn't with design. It was always with creating docs because you don't think docs and design. You think design is more visual. And when you see docs, you're like, who created this seven, eight page Google doc talking about this specific product? And that's where I am now. So I spend a lot of my time in Google Docs reading as well as creating them. And then from the analytical side, ton of internal dashboards, man. That's really what I'm looking at most of the time because we have dashboards for everything. Competitors, specific movies, users, cancellations, signups. Think thousands and thousands of dashboards. <laughs> That's the best way I can explain it. How have you improved as a writer? What are the different steps that you've taken to feel more comfortable being someone that creates these really polished docs? just creating them and not being so hard on myself, just jumping out there. And the best part is my team has noticed it. This is one of the best compliments I've ever got at Netflix. And I don't even think my teammate knew when she told me how impactful it was going to be because I was telling her like, oh yeah, I'm still trying to work on my docs. Like I'm a type one up for this. And she was like, what do you mean? You still trying to work on them? You create amazing docs. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, man, no, your docs are so detailed. They're really important. They help the team understand what's going on. I was so happy to hear that because I remember 
remember years ago, my same design manager telling me that she thinks that I should communicate more. So it's literally just been trying, right? It's just been trying and learning and always being in this research and discovery mode where when somebody else sends me an amazing doc, I'm scanning it and I'm understanding what I like about it. So when it's time for me to create either a similar doc, I could refer back to that for some kind of an outline, or I at least take out the pieces of that that I know I should have in the doc that I create. So I'm always trying to look for what that perfect doc is. And when I find it, I take pieces from it, man. But this is a personal thing that I knew I needed to get better in. I didn't want somebody to have to tell me to get better in my doc creation. So I just put the time in, man. It's really encouraging to hear you say that actually, because in my last role at Maven, that's kind of been the same answer for me too, where right away, like my source of imposter syndrome wasn't necessarily my design. It was my writing because all of a sudden I was injected into this writing culture where you were expected to communicate your ideas rigorously and as concisely as possible. And that can be a little bit intimidating for especially more junior designers who are just like, well, I'm just like leveling up my Figma game. And actually you're expected to nail communication and that's the biggest part of your role. And if you think about all the people that are going to be reading this doc, Rid, when I tell you, you'll have a doc at Netflix that might be 10 pages, but the doc actually ends up stretching to be like 22 pages because you have that many comments. We're a very feedback focused company. So we leave our docs open for any and everybody to get feedback. And that's how you start to see all of the interconnections of things because you'll have somebody give feedback and it's like, well, why would they respond? And it's like, oh, you didn't know that they're affected because of this. And it's like, oh, wow. So when you start to go through all the comments, you see one, all the people that's just interested and in how smart they are and just how passionate they are that they would want to get feedback, maybe on a project that they're not even working on. But then second, you get to see how many people touch different things by the amount of people that leave comments. I was trying to think of a positive way to say what growth design is. And I came up with, it's just the evolution of product design. It's just the next step because when you think product design, you may not automatically think business, the metrics behind things, revenue, stuff like that, dollars and cents. You need to worry about that. And if you're gonna be worrying about that, then you're gonna find yourself in different conversations with different people that might not wanna get in Figma. So they're gonna wanna read docs. So you have to know how to create docs. And then they're gonna create things like dash so you have to know how to use dashboards and understand how queries work. You'll get to a certain point where you have more responsibilities and those responsibilities require you to learn new things, new skills. And those new skills, I think, is what takes you to that next step of growth design. That's fascinating. I haven't actually heard it phrased like that before, but it does make sense because it's an expansion of a lot of the core skill sets that you would associate with product design. I, mm -hmm. I'm interested in hearing you talk a little bit more about the feedback process too, because as someone that is really deeply embedded in the business side of Netflix and not necessarily just the product org, I would imagine that you're pretty consistently dealing with a diverse of stakeholders and a lot of higher up people that, you know, really have a lot of weight at the company. And so what advice do you have for people to improve the way that they solicit feedback internally? Advice from Fonz on how to take feedback from not just executives, but anybody in life. I think you first, you have to be a good listener. I think the best thing you can do is take in all advice. You should openly take in it all. That's the first thing, though, is you can't be defensive out the gate. You have to listen. Become a good listener. That's the first rule. My wife told me that years ago. She was like, you're not really that good of a listener. And I'm thinking <laughs> to myself like, what? I'm the master listener. I actually wasn't. I have to be honest with you. I feel like ever since that day, I've been so much more conscious about listening, which means I'm being more respectful in conversations because I'm not over talking people. I don't come to conversations thinking people only want to hear from me or I have everything to say. I want to hear from other people. It's kind of hard to learn when you're talking, right? So when you're listening and if you're fortunate enough to get feedback from various people, isn't that really like a positive? Mm -hmm. The thing I think is that a lot of people equate feedback with criticism. And I think that's a culture thing. That's not necessarily true. I could give you positive feedback for the rest of your life and you never take it as criticism and you look forward to it. Now, if you've only received feedback that felt more negative or condescending or personal, then you're going to have a different perspective on feedback. At Netflix, we look at feedback as I'm just trying to help you get better or be better or make this project 
better. Part of the culture deck at Netflix, which is this amazing document that we have. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's called the culture deck. And it's just like amazing oath that the original team of Netflix drafted. It's just like iconic Silicon Valley artifact that just talks about what the culture of Netflix is, right? And everybody at Netflix, your decisions that you should be making should all be for the better of Netflix. Like whatever you're doing should be for the betterment of Netflix at its heart, right? At its core. So if you're living by that, then Any feedback you give somebody should be technically because you think this would be better for Netflix as a whole. So it's never like, hey, Rid, I think you should just change this design because I just want to see you work harder or I just don't like your designs. It's I like what you did. But you know what? Remember, 50 percent of our customers may not be coming from this device. So if that's the case, even though I love your current design, I don't know if it's going to transfer to these other devices as smoothly. And it's like, wow, that's great feedback. That's not even a critique. I told you I love your design. I'm just telling you, I don't know if you've thought about it far enough for it to work in all of the different use cases that we needed to work in. You want an environment where people feel comfortable giving that feedback because I'm right. But you want that kind of environment for people to be able to receive that because they probably won't even make that mistake again. The next time they'll say, oh, wait a minute. No, this design looks fabulous, but I have to make sure it's going to work for all of our users. So that's an example of how you want this feedback loop where people are constantly growing, designs are growing because designs are organic. So they should be getting better every day. It also fosters communication, which I think is another critical part of growth design that we spoke about earlier. As designers, you need to be sharing often and early and having people design is inclusive but in certain places and I think at certain times design becomes very exclusive that's not how I design as a designer I'm sharing with everybody all the time all across the board everybody's involved so when it's time for a design to roll out or for me to share to a bigger team or bigger org I'm confident because so many different people have already given feedback on this that it's ready to go So the feedback is super important and we do it all the time and we're very candid about it. And I think it's one of the parts that people really love about working at Netflix. What's some feedback that you've received that has impacted your career or how you work? My PM told me, and I'm going to be very transparent with you. So what's some feedback that I've received at Netflix that's changed my career? My PM gave me some feedback last year that sent me through almost all of the different feelings of emotions. I was shocked, and then I was sad, and then I was curious, and then I was understanding, and then I was happy, and then I was appreciative at the end. She told me, Fonz, when we're having these team presentations on these meetings, you have to stop reading off of your docs. It sounds like you're reading from a script, and it sounds like you don't know what you're talking about and you know what you're talking about she gave me some other positive feedback in it as well as like you're great with your designs i think you bring a lot of to the table but it was that second part and at first i was like man that's some harsh feedback it sounded like i don't know what i'm talking about so i kind of doubled down on it the wrong way what she was saying was i'm doing a disservice to myself This is time for me to show up in front of my peers, leaders in a company. I've been working on this stuff so hard. I understand it so well. Why get to the point of explaining it and falling short because I'm reading off of a script? You should not be reading off of a script when it's time to present to a bigger audience. You should understand what you're going to say and you should almost have your script memorized so that you can be natural. You can flow. You want your eyes focused on the camera. There's just a lot in that feedback that she gave me ever since. Since then, I've just looked at the way I present a lot different. And you know, I do public speaking as well. So this helps not only with just my Netflix career, but this just helps with my career as a communicator. That was some amazing feedback and I'm so thankful for it. I didn't know how to take it at first. I took it personally. That's what I did. I took it personally Mm. and she wasn't being personal. She was being professional. She actually was caring and saying, my bro, you're like missing your shots to show how smart you are by reading off of a script. Stop. So. Yeah, I love that example. I, it also kind of shocks me a little bit, too, because I know you and I've talked to you enough where it, it feels like communication is effortless for you. So to hear right, you reading off a skip, I'm like, presenting. What? But the thing is, when you're presenting certain things, you don't want to ramble. You don't want to freestyle when you're in front of 200 people and you only have a couple seconds. So it's not that I was reading off of a script like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. 
It's the fact of you can tell when somebody is looking at something to make sure that they're saying it right, like their eye movements and things of that nature. When you want to become a master communicator at the highest level that I know she's pushing me to be, you have to master that skill of no matter how complicated the content is, you should be able to express it in the most clearest and simple ways and understandable ways. And I thank her for that feedback. What's some advice or principles that you would recommend for designers who want to improve the way that they present their work and communicate with different stakeholders? Well, I would say this is bigger than designers. Feedback I would give anybody that want to communicate with stakeholders or team members about something. One, you should be organized and confident. You should know what you're going to talk about. And when I say you should know what you're going to talk about, not scrambling to know what you're talking about. I'm saying being versed enough that you don't need a script or any kind of sheet or any notes when it's time to present in a bigger audience. Bigger audiences are more comfortable with it sounding as if you're naturally flowing and you're paying attention to the camera and you seem confident when you may have notes or something like that and it looks like you may pause for a second because you're looking at your notes. Your audience can notice that and it's just another step of communication that you can level up to. It's something that I've been practicing on. I got some feedback from a PM of mine that she felt when I use my notes, it takes away from my presentation of truly understanding the topics, even though she knows I understand it. That was some interesting feedback for me because I took it personal where I should have took it professional. And after I got out of my feelings, I did. Now that's something that I actually try my best to avoid. I study my notes before multiple times before it's time to present. When it's my go, I'm smooth, ready to go, clear. I'm happy with whatever I'm presenting visually. Then it comes off a lot more natural. And I think that's what people are looking for in a leader. When it's time to communicate, you give off this calm, poised, natural, confident feeling. If we were to create a little side by side, and on one side we have 2018 Fonz about to enter Coursera and Fonz today, what's the biggest way you think you've grown as a designer? How have I grown between 2018 and 2023? I would say, I don't know if I'm trying to prove to myself that I'm a designer, prove to the world anymore. I know my confidence, Rid. I think that's what I would say is Hmm. my confidence because being able to perform on what we will all consider as being the biggest stage of at a tech company like Coursera, helping them go IPO and having tens of millions of users and seeing people using my work and then moving over to another superstar company like Netflix and being able to be there three years plus and still be considered as a shining star and solving these big problems and knowing I can do it. That's the thing is that I know I can do it and I do it every day. I'm great at my job. And I think by having that understanding, I can have fun with my job and I'm not anxious or I'm not nervous, or I'm not over talking or overworking. I'm doing what I know needs to be done because I'm a professional and I'm experienced at it. So I would say my confidence. I think a lot of people would look at 2023 funds and think, dang, like he made it. He totally made it, you know? And so Stop, that's why man, it's so, I'm but here's the, the most thing. humblest guy. I'm I know you are. Guy. So don't cut this out of the podcast. You have to keep I will, that part. That I will, I will. Thank you so much for that compliment, man, because <laughs> I still am down to earth. Fonz, I'll still go grab a slice of pizza with you. I'll still get on the phone with you for 15 minutes. But sometimes when I look in the mirror, I am very, very proud of where the journey that I yeah. have endured to get to where I am now. And then for it to still feel like I still have so much more to go. Go is even brighter in the future than it is now is very humbling, but if but it's rewarding at the end of the day. I definitely will leave that in <laughs> for what it's worth. I think what makes that so interesting to me is you're at this point where you do have such a level of confidence and you've achieved so much. And yet here you are last year, you enrolled in the Stanford design thinking program. And that is like incredible to me that someone at your level is still investing in yourself like that. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about what led you to enroll and what that program was like. Why did I enroll in the Stanford Design Thinking Program? 
AKA why does Fonz continuously love to learn? I'm a lifelong learner, man. There's so much to learn. It's just so much, bro. There's no way I could learn it all in this lifetime, but I'm gonna try my best, right? And I'm also one of those people who, I didn't come from all of the resources. Like I didn't come from, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. So now that I'm at a place where I see these different opportunities that are attainable, I'm gonna reach for it. That's why I even signed up for the Maven platform. It was something that I learned about that I was like, well, maybe I can get access to this and then it'll open these new doors. So I need to take advantage of that. And that's the same thing with the Stanford program. I knew design thinking in and out before I took the program, but I knew that there was things that I would learn from the program. And I'm so glad that I went because the capstone project that we ended up working on was an idea that I had been thinking about in my head. And I used that program as a way to push it that next mm. step to keep that idea going. So it ended up being super beneficial for me because it allowed me to put the idea through the ringers as well as it grew my network of people and just the dedication dedication to get through it. It was tough. I didn't realize how much work it was going to be before I started with juggling work, kids, doing homework, going to class, then class during the week, as well as finding time to meet with your team. It just really reminded me of how, and shout out to all of my secondary education, it's not easy to go to school while you have a full-time job and you have a family. So I think being able to constantly push myself and take those risks is something that I've always done because I think the reward at the end of the day is always super worth it. When you look at yourself and kind of evaluate your own skill set, are there areas where you think you can still improve? Of course, there's a ton of areas where I could still improve. I think I can pay even more attention to detail. Like I think there's never anything wrong with paying attention to detail, but I don't think that means microanalyzing things. I think that means even if you've looked at something five times, it's nothing wrong with looking at it that sixth. There's nothing wrong with taking a break, walking away, coming back, looking something again. Never just leaning on the fact of you saying, well, I'm a pro. I know this. I can do this. I don't need that. Mm. That's a little bit of hubris. You should probably just like chill for a second and say, well, you know what? I probably should do this extra comb over this double check to just to make sure because, you know, I'm human. Human makes mistakes. And you have to be humble to say that. You have to be humble to say, I make mistakes. So I should double check something or triple check something to make sure that I didn't make a mistake. Some people would probably never say something like that because they're like, oh, I'm so good at my job. I'm perfect. Man, listen, nothing wrong with a last second glance at something that I think goes a long way. And that could be with a design. That could be with a document. That could be with an email. That could be with a thought. That could be with something that you're about to say. So uh, just like double checking, triple checking on things, I think is, is something that I would want to get better in. And I think something else I would want to work on is still my documentation. Like I said, I'm just getting started, but it feels so good. It feels so good to post these docs and have my teammates respond and tell me they're helpful and they think that I'm doing a good job in that area because that's an area that not I struggled, but I never really put a lot of time into. What advice do you have for someone who maybe is a bit earlier in the career in more of a traditional UI UX role, and maybe they're listening to this and they're interested in transitioning into something that looks more like growth design? How could you transition into growth design the easiest way, I'll say? I think it's by evaluating where you are at your current company. Can you talk to some of the people on the business side at your current company? Can you talk to some PMs? Can you do some of your own homework to maybe look at the business side with whatever info you may have access to? Can you strike up some conversations around growth design at your company to see if anybody's interested or if you really are interested in it? Once you do that, I think that opens the door to the business side of just business in general. And if you're a designer and you want to get into growth, then I think you should start to become more interested in business. Why not learn about relevant business? That's why I'm saying instead of going to business school or just getting the Wall Street Journal, maybe you can talk to some people that's on your internal team about the current state of the business, where the business is going, ways that design could help affect those numbers and get some early access to growth design before you just decide that you say, hey, I 
I know I want to be a growth designer. It's like maybe talk to some people in the space as well. Talk to people like me. Talk to any other person that's already in that space so that you can ask them a lot of questions to make sure that this is something that you're really interested in. And if it is, then now, like I said, you're going to need to be focusing a lot more on maybe what you focus on at your day to day now. Maybe you don't do a lot of metrics. You might want to start learning about those metrics. Maybe you don't interact with your data science team that much at your job. You might want to interact with them a lot more. Start asking them questions. Start to see if there's dashboards that you can look at to learn more about the data and just use your current resources, I think, to get started. You can always Google and go on YouTube and stuff like that, but I think it would be more impactful if you did it with something that was relevant. And that's why I said your current position or company. I love that. I think that the quality of the questions that you ask says a lot about the feedback and the level of investment that you're going to get from people in return. Can you help designers who maybe are a little bit less business savvy come up with the right questions to even ask internally so that they can learn more about the business and even have different executives or people in data science identify them as someone who cares and who is knowledgeable Mm. about this. So that will vary per company, but I think there are some fundamental questions that you can ask around what metrics are important to our company. At Netflix, the metrics that's important to us are our current subscribers. How many subscribers we have? Why? Because you do the subscribers times how much we charge for our plans, and that's how much money the company's making. Right. But another number that's important to us is how many people are canceling, because what does that do? That subtracts from the amount of revenue that's coming in. So you should take time to analyze your company and ask questions around what metrics are important to the company. If you're at a software company, it's probably going to be downloads. If you're at a video streaming company, it could be views. If you're at a startup, it could be signups and then double clicking on whatever metric somebody gives you where if they say, OK, well, right now we're focused on signups and it's like, OK, can I ask some more questions around signups? Are we doing good with the signups? Are we slow? Are we in hyper growth right now? Are there ways that you think we could increase our subscribers or signups? And that's already getting them to have to think and say, oh, wow, you know what? We're doing pretty good right now, but there's an area that we want to improve in. Boom. That's what you want to hear. Now you want to ask them, what area do you want to improve in? And now you start to see, can you help with that area? Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but maybe you just even having this conversation will help out in that area because you might have an idea that could potentially solve that. So I think it's questions around understanding what metrics are important to your company, what metrics would the company like to improve, and do they have any suggestions on how they can improve it, or you suggest some suggestions on how they can improve it. So you kind of lead the conversation along to where you start showing curiosity, but you end it with showing your understanding because you kind of pitched a solution once they fully explained to you where things were and where a problem could be. What about for a designer who is interested in dipping their toes into management and actually getting into the people side of the business and their role? Do you have any advice for them to go from pure IC to kind of starting to stretch themselves in that way? I think the best way to start with that is you asking yourself, are you ready to take that step away from maybe solving problems for the product and be more focused on making sure that your team is happy and functioning well and hiring and supporting individuals? And I think those type of questions are internal questions that you have to ask yourself. If you love being in Figma and you love being creative and kind of being hands-on in the product creation and development, that might not be what your day-to-day is as a design manager. That's most likely not what your day is going to be. So if you're cool with taking that step away, then cool. You're on your way to, but not yet. If you're cool with taking that step away from the product and the craft, but you are interested in now working with people and growing people and growing people's careers, then boom, you do have a lane in management. If you don't want to do the craft, but you're not really sure if you want to help individuals with their career on a day-to-day and a long-term basis, then you have to ask yourself, are you really ready for management though? How do you grow the other designers around you? Support. I just... 
I bring high level conversations to the table. Like for instance, I just suggested that we have a strategy forum once a month on Fridays. I think my team, we only get to talk to each other on per product basis. I want to talk from a more 10,000 foot level. I just want to bring words to the table like innovation. Let's go. Not, oh, I'm working on providing this to this or doing that to that. I don't want to jump down into the weeds. I want to be from a 10,000 foot perspective because I want to foster those conversations. I want to foster leadership. I want people to continue to be thought leaders in this space. But if we're not communicating, if we're not hearing from each other, that's not good. But then second, what are we working on if we're not coming together to strategize what we're working on? Then who's coming up with what we're working on? And I want us to have more impact on what we're working on. So I come up with ideas like that. I suggest books for my teams to read. I suggest social events. I'm very active on Slack. I try to build individual relationships with people outside of just design, meaning I know who's having a baby. I know who just brought a house. I share pictures with people. So it's just bringing my full authentic self to my job, I think allows people to see how passionate I am about it and how much fun I still have in it. And I think that inspires them to want to still have fun and bring themselves to the table. So when you do all of that, now you have a happy team of authentic people, smart, focused, aligned, feeling supported. I feel like that's the recipe for success on a design team for sure. I love that idea of bringing your full self as a way to invest in the team culture. A lot of times when I hear people talk about that, it almost feels self-serving. Like I want to be seen, I will bring my full self, but this way of like having that be an answer to how you invest in other people, I haven't heard it like that before. And I really- I mean, because I, like I want you to bring you to the table. I don't want you to yep. leave out 25% of yourself because you think I'm not interested or I might anything. Bring it, it's you, right? Bring you show up. I want you to show up. We hired you, we didn't hire 75% of you. Netflix didn't hire alternative fonts or fonts 2.0. They hired fonts. So why would I come to work and not be myself? You know what I mean? And I think any environment that doesn't allow you to be yourself, you need to second guess whether or not you want to stay in that environment because you should be able to be accepted and it should be an inclusive environment to where you would feel uncomfortable if you wasn't being yourself. I would feel uncomfortable. I think people would notice if I wasn't being me. I'm curious what your motivation is this far along in your career. What else do you want to achieve? I want to keep thriving. I want to keep thriving and I want to get more into the ed tech space. I do sometimes think about entrepreneurship and stuff and investing. I've put a lot of time into learning the VC space and being able to make my first couple of investments. And I would one day like to build some kind of like a design, online design school or platform. That's why I'm excited to be working with Maven and Dive because there's a lot of people that's interested in design. The technology has made the curriculum and the education a lot more more accessible, but somebody needs to create this. And then I think somebody needs to create this from a perspective like mine. So I think that would be one of my longer term goals is to still make sure that I'm always being active in the ed tech space, because if I'm helping people learn, then I'm kind of directly and indirectly affecting their lives. And I think that ties into impact and we all want to have it. Well, not we all, but I want to have impact while I'm here on this planet. And I know Helping people change their lives through learning skills or getting a new job or growing is a sure shot way to do that. This is as good a time as any. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about the course that you're working on. And maybe you could just share a bit about what people can expect, who's it's for, and anything else. So I am fortunate enough to be working with Dive on a growth design course that I want to pull the curtain back on growth design. Not that it's a secret, but I just want to give more insight into what growth design is and what the different layers of it that I think you should learn. Two of the major parts that I think I'm really going to focus on is the user research side because you need to understand why user research is so important and you need to understand how the impact of user research can really make or break a product. And I, I also want to focus on the experimentation side of growth design where you don't know what's the right answer. So you have to be able to think about ways to experiment with solutions to get to the right one. And that's a critical part of growth design because it's all about iteration. I teach people about setting up a test and understanding the different parts of a test. So using the user research to help validate an idea and then taking that idea through kind of 
prototyping to get to the point where now you understand that, okay, here are these different versions of this product that I have. Let's see which one of these give the best metrics. And then by learning those metrics, you now have the better solution to move forward with. So I'm going to try to walk through, like I'm still figuring it out right now, but the goal would be to walk our students through coming up with an idea, figuring out how to validate that idea, and then figuring out how to actually put it into an experiment to learn about if this idea is really worth doing before you roll out the idea. Also explaining what the growth design process is like at Netflix, because I know there's a lot of companies that do things certain ways, but introducing them to how we set up a product roll out before any of our customers end up seeing it. And hopefully they'll be able to take that type of information and use it in their day to day at their company, however they feel fit. I love it. And I'm excited for the course largely, I mean, selfishly, because this is an area that I'm trying to grow in as well is, you know, it's one thing to validate, is this going to be a positive user experience for something for a subset of users, but it's another to understand as quickly as possible, what is the ceiling for impact that this set of changes can have as a way to even understand whether it's something that we should be investing in as a company and Mm -hmm. trying to get at that ceiling and modeling out the potential impact as quick as possible. I kind of had that moment earlier, um, or I guess at the end of last year where I realized that I actually, that just wasn't really even on my radar, this idea of like modeling impact. And I've been doing this for a long time and it's so important. And so so focused on execution. That's how we get started. It's all about what's that final artifact? What's that JPEG? What's that PNG? What's that link for me to see what you got? Yes, that's important, bro. Not taking anything away from that. But what if that link, what if that JPEG, that PNG doesn't convert anything. Does it move the needle? It's like, it wasn't a waste, but it's like, damn, what happened? So with growth design, you want to try to figure that stuff out before you get to that point. So when you roll it out, you're a little more confident on what you're rolling out because you went through these process of user researching and experimentation. So the numbers should be a little more in your favor because of these extra steps that you now do worry about, like you said before, that you wasn't worrying about. Last question. Yep. What's something that you believe about design that most other designers might disagree with? There's thousands of layers of design. There's thousands of layers of design that you don't think about. And there's thousands of layers of design that don't even exist yet. Like I was talking to a buddy of mine who's a VP over at BP, the energy company, and he was telling me about business design. And I was like, what's business design? So I felt the same way about business design that some people probably feel about growth design. Like, what's growth design? I'm like, what? You don't know what growth design is. And then when he told me business design, I'm like, what's business design? (laughs) So there's a lot of layers of design that want to be discovered, that have not been discovered, that are open for you to become a master or expert in. So just open your eyes, get hungry about discovery of design again, ask questions, do your research because design is growing at a light speed. It's getting more and more respect than ever before. It's actually sitting at the table next to engineer, like next to engineering equally in certain conversations and at certain tables. And there was a time where nobody even thought about design. So who knows where design is going to be 10 years from now. So make sure to stay on the innovative side of it and stay at the front of design and be a trendsetter for design because it's changing and it's exciting. I mean, if you think of like AI design and it's just so much. So I'm still excited about design every day. I hope everybody else is. You brought up AI and now I, now I have to ask, it, it does feel like things are accelerating so quickly right now. Mm-hmm. How do you make sure that we are staying at the forefront of design and not getting passed up? Conversation, communication. You and I need to talk because then you and I need to talk with other people. Amazing platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter where you can really get the conversation going and we can learn how to grow with these technologies as opposed to always being so scared of change and looking at change as something negative. AI is not taking my job. I'm not worried about AI taking my job. I'm more excited about how do I use AI to be better at my job? Or how do I learn about AI that I can teach other people that they can use it to be better at what they need to do? So embrace change as opposed to being so scared of it. 
I love it. I'm going to take that as an encouraging note to end on. This has been super inspiring. Thank you for the time. No, this is great. Thank you, man. And and thanks for the support, man. You've been a supporter of mine from day one. Thanks for the patience. I'm really excited about this growth design course. I've been putting a lot of time into it. You've been very helpful with the building of it. So shout out to the dive team. Shout out to the Maven team for sure. I appreciate it. Thank you.